what I'm planning to cover is um, first the sort of higher level part of how to decide whether to containerize or not, the arguments I'm aware of. Um, and then I'm going to go more into the how-tos, um, best practices, things like that. Not necessarily super tied to Docker, but sort of in that area. And then I'm going to go into the more, um, let's say, lower level stuff, bugs that I've seen and, and things like that. So what I'm not going to cover is um, things like what Docker is, uh, how it works, um, Docker run commands, running with the official image, things like that. Um, if you're here for that, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, my colleague Rafa and I did a session on that last year, so you can look up the video. And I hope you still find this stuff interesting, because I think it kind of fills the gap. Um, so to give you a, an idea of the angle from which I'm coming, uh, the more m most of the higher level stuff will come from our own process of uh, putting stuff into containers. Um, and the, the more low level stuff is coming from um, mostly from our consulting and support engagements um, when, where we, we, we found quite, quite interesting issues. Um, so with that, I'm going to start with uh, a little story of when we discussed uh, dockerizing our own environments. Um, because the whole discussion started with a bit of a ping pong in the sense of, you know, what does actually, what does Docker bring us? And it was like, oh, but you can have the same thing on your laptop as you have in production. Uh, well, that's not necessarily a Docker thing. I mean, you can do that with Vagrant or whatever other things that we tried and didn't really take off internally. Um, and the discussion was kind of going nowhere until one of my colleagues, who I really respect and he's a very clever guy, came up with this argument. Um, <laughs> which I found really funny and very sad at the same time. Like, is this, uh, there's really no substance to this? And uh, that was actually a breaking point in the sense that we started to have a more constructive discussion and I'm gonna go over the things that we actually found out that are interesting. But um, looking back, it actually made quite a bit of sense. Uh, maybe not with these words, but um, I think if people kind of buy into a certain technology, are excited by it, then you, know, you get a lot more chances to, to have, to have uh, you know, traction. So uh, even if you can do the same thing, you know, in terms of having the same thing on your laptop with Vagrant, if people hate Vagrant but love Docker, then you know, go with Docker. <laughs> so um, I'm used to ignoring these sort of arguments because um, they're non-technical, but I think uh, you know, they have their validity. So let me move to, to the more technical arguments. Uh, one, and I think the biggest for us was um, the fact that we, we could do orchestration. So with something like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm, I think for us it's going to be Kubernetes. Um, and that makes a lot of sense, especially if you're running stuff on your own data center, because then you can allocate resources dynamically. Um, in the cloud, it's not that much um, in terms of because in, in the cloud, you can normally uh, choose an instance size that kind of works. Uh, but even there, if you're thinking about pricing, um, I, at least I have a few customers who um, you know, claim that they get a lot, more, a lot better deals by having huge machines and then using uh, containers to allocate resources dynamically on them, things like reserved instances and whatnot. Um, but the win for us because we're running on AWS, is uh, that we can um, do orchestration without being tied to, uh, to the provider's auto scaling. Um, so with that, let me give you a bit of a demo on, on Kubernetes. It's not going to be like a whole, full sort of production thing. It's going to be more of a proof of concept. Um, so, and, and, and you can find all the, all the stuff that I'm typing here. It's, it's there on GitHub, so you can look it up and play with it later. And, um, so I have this, uh, I'm not sure if you can see. I think it's fine, huh? Especially on that monitor. No? Well. It used to work. Anyway. Um, I know. What if I move this a bit? <laughs> Low-tech solutions. Okay, so um, 
So I have this little Kubernetes cluster. There's this app called Minikube that you can, you can spin up your local one node Kubernetes cluster. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a uh, solar cloud setup. I'm going to start Zookeeper, solar, and then I'm going to scale out solar to, uh, to two instances using Kubernetes. Um, so the files I have here, besides my notes, are uh, all some, let's say, configuration files. Um, so let's start with, uh, with this Zookeeper controller. This tells it what pods to start. And pods, pods in Kubernetes are, um, it can be one or more containers. In this case, with Solar and Zookeeper, I'm going to have one container per pod. So that's like an entity of work. Um, and, and this controller tells it uh, basically to spin one instance of Zookeeper with this con Zookeeper container and expose port 2181. So I'm going to go ahead and start it. And now if I do get pods, I will see my Zookeeper node has started. Now, if I want to access this uh, from solar or from my own uh, terminal, then I need to expose this as a service. And this is what uh, Zookeeper service uh, is is about. So I'm just going to forward basically this 2181 port and expose it as Zookeeper service. So, hello. What's with you? Anyway. So now I can do get services and this is the port on which uh, Zookeeper now can be, can be accessed on. So I can say, I'm going to save this in an environment variable, ZK port. And I'm going to also save the host, which is, in this case, is I have only one node. It's that, that node's IP. But to, to show you, I'm going to upload the uh, solar config right to the Zookeeper. to show that it works, or hopefully it works. OK, so now I have the, uh, the, the config set in Zookeeper. And now I'm going to do the same with Solar. So um, the Solar controller, this again tells it to start one Solar node. And uh, it's going to use the official uh, Solar uh, image. And I'm going to, again, expose port 893. And I'm going to point it to, uh, to our Zookeeper service. So the official solar image is smart enough to, that if you pass this uh, environment variable, it's going to modify solar.in.sh so that uh, it starts solar pointing to, to Zookeeper. Let me copy paste because it's safer. All right, so now if I do get pods, there's my solar pod in addition to the zookeeper pod. So now hopefully it's going to work with, I'm going to create a service which does the same thing as you saw the, um, with the zookeeper service. Just basically forwards the port, 8983. Eight, so now if I do get services again, this is my, my solar port. So let me connect to solar to see that it works. It's a different port each time. Yeah, I have solar. And uh, sure enough, I'm not sure if you can see that. But it is pointed to my Zookeeper service. And I can actually see the, if I go to cloud, I can see the config that I just uploaded. All right, so um, now let's say I add more hardware to this cluster and uh, I want to add more solar nodes. Um, so I'll just need to modify this replicas, which is was configured to one, to give me one solar node. I modify this to two, and this will spin up uh, another solar node. 
Of course, this is just an example. Normally, you will have rules in terms of how to place nodes and things like that, but um, you know, by and large. So if I do get pods again, you can see now I have two solar pods. Um, and I should be able to see this in here, not graph because I have no collection yet. Um, but I can see this with live nodes. I have two nodes right now. Um, and just to finish it up, so to speak, I'm going to create a collection with two shards. Port review. Huh? Ah, I didn't save the solar host solar port. So solar host is, again, my IP. And solar port is this guy here from solar service. OK, so now hopefully. It's slow, but it's working. Is it? Is it? <laughs> Yay. Oh, I have it on two nodes. OK. So let's just index a couple of documents and do a search, and then we're done. All right. I mean, a couple of the same documents. That's good enough. Um, and let me do a commit. All right, so now I should be able to do a search and show those documents. Sure enough, they're there, and they're also distributed to shards. Shard one. I have some on one shard, some on the other. So you know, everything seems to work as expected, so to speak. Um, all right. So let me move on to Some other things, that, some other conclusions that that we came we came to. So one of, is this thing about having the same thing on your laptop as in testing, as in production. Uh, the difference is, I think, with containers compared to VM-based solutions, is that containers are, you know, those images are lighter, they're easier to download, um, and the fact that the, the Docker is the future, so there's a lot of community, a lot of hype around it. Uh, you can find a lot of software that's already there. You don't need to install or anything like that. You just pull up the container and start it. Uh, and of course, it, it starts quicker and things like that. Um, and also, when it comes to development, uh, this becomes uh, also an, an efficiency problem because um, you know it, it's uh, a Docker image is gonna uh, a Docker container is gonna be lighter. Well, actually, if you're running on a Mac, you have a Linux VM, so mm, not that great. Um, now, let me move on to the, to the middle part, to the how-tos. Um, in this demo, I only had one zookeeper, um, but normally you have more, and you also need to make sure that they're on, hosted on different hosts so that one going down will not kill everything. In Kubernetes, uh, you can do that with something called pod, pod anti-affinity. Um, and more of the same applies to solar, right? You don't want to, I mean, normally you would want to uh, balance how many solar nodes you allocate to the host you have. Um, and the same applies to allocating shards uh, of, of a collection or shards in general um, to have your solar cluster balanced. Um, and the way to do that in terms of scaling strategies, you can have more shards per uh, collection initially, and so that you can add nodes and then rebalance them and still have a, a balanced solar cluster. And if you have time series data, uh, this, uh, I think a good practice is to have time-based collections. Um, so let's say, not time-based, actually size-based collections. So when you get to, let's say, five gigabytes per shard, you're gonna create a new collection and you're gonna index there. Um, and so this allows you to decide at every point you create a new collection. If you have, now you have more nodes, you, you can create a new collection with more nodes, with no, more shards. And so uh, you're scaling up uh, indexing that way. And also 
deletion is going to be much more efficient because you're going to delete uh, complete, complete collections. Um, and also caches are going to work better because um, collections that are no longer written to, you know, caches will live a lot longer. Uh, now let me move on to the underlying, let's say, storage and operating system stuff be, uh, behind Solar. Uh, one thing that has to do with Docker here um, is to use uh, volume. So normally uh, the disk stuff isn't persisted. Um, the mounts aren't persisted uh, with Docker, so you need to use volumes. Um, in the case of Kubernetes, there's a concept called stateful set, which is a bit more than just using volumes. Um, of course, you need to make sure that uh, the, the solar process has access to those, uh, you know, in terms of permissions um, to that data. Um, and in terms of performance, uh, of course, local disks are, will be faster than, than network-based solutions. Uh, but if you do go for <laughs> network-based solutions, for example, AWS, uh, in AWS to use EBS, uh, then it's good to, be, to have them on a separate network card than your main network stuff. Um, so in, in this case, you would use EBS optimized um, to, to make you know, the regular network latency uh, acceptable so that you, know, you don't get zookeeper timeouts and things like that. That would be pretty tragic. Um, and um, yeah, in, in, in AWS, you can also make sure that um, your instances have enhanced networking. So this is a driver thing, it's not something you need to pay for, but it gets you really uh, much more consistent network uh, performance. Um, now, one question that comes up um, quite, uh, quite frequently is whether to have, uh, have big or, or small hosts. Now that you're containerizing and you can uh, dynamically allocate containers, uh, you know, how to go with it. I think uh, if you have small hosts so that you have one container per host, you lose quite a lot of the advantages that come with uh, co-locating multiple containers on a host. Uh, for example, the operating system caches part uh, that is managed separately than the uh, container memory. So those are shared. So if you have, you may, for example, co-locate Solar with something that doesn't use I.O. that much, and then Solar will be able to use the whole um, remaining memory as opposed to uh, running those other containers on a separate host and then having some free memory that's not used. Uh, but you know, if you have hosts that are too big, then you're likely to run into issues that I'm going to talk a bit about in terms of memory allocation. I don't think uh, you know, the whole ecosystem is really ready to use very big hosts and you know, terabytes of RAM and things like that. Um, and also, if one of those giant hosts goes, goes down, then you know, that's going to be much more disruptive. Um, and the same question applies to whether you should have big or small solar nodes. Um, uh, but I think the rule of thumb here is to have them as big as they can comfortably be, um, in the sense that um, if you have many small nodes that you know, will require many small shards and that will have overhead and it's going to be more difficult to manage, Zookeeper, cl the, the cluster state will be bigger and things like that. Um, I wouldn't worry so much about uh, things that are single-threaded, such as full-text search or facets, because normally they get nat naturally paralyzed between either multiple requests or multiple shards that you hit in a single request. Um, uh, indexing is... Uh, definitely multi-threaded, so that can usually use up all the CPU if you if it's needed. Um, and I mean, for facets, if you use the uh, regular facets, so not the JSON ones, you can also set facet the threads. Um, but when I say comf how com comfortably big they can be, I mean not too big so that you have like two solar nodes and one goes down and then you're in trouble. But um, also, if you have multiple nodes, uh, they can't be too big because you cannot allocate an unlimited amount of, uh, of heap to them, even though you may have a lot of memory. Um, so let me talk a bit about heap. Um, I think the heap requirement will mainly uh, be influenced by how much data you have, um, but also um, on how much um, uh, how expensive your requests are, so that sort of transient memory. So the more data you have, uh, the more, uh, let's say, static um, 
data structures such as you know, pointers to the terms, dictionary, doc values, those will take more, more memory. Um, and then with that also caches will be, um, will take more memory, but of course that depends more on your cache configuration. Um, so a rule of thumb for me at least is to start with, let's say you just start solar, it loads up the indices, you see how much memory it takes, and then you add, let's say, 100% more as some headroom for your request, but also for the garbage collector to uh, you know, be able to go up and down. And of course, you cannot allocate too much memory to get close to the host limit. Uh, so if you have, let's say, 60 gigs of RAM, 64, let's say you don't want to have two 30 gig heaps there, because then you don't have enough room for operating system caches. Um, and there's, there are also, you know, as the, as the heap grows with your data and your requests, I think uh, there are some issues to, to be considered. One of them is that at 32 gigs, the JVM loses the ability to compress pointers. Um, so there's an overhead then in terms of usable heap, um, um, which, you know, again, will depend on your use case. You can do a heap dump and see how many objects are actually there, so that gives you an idea of how many pointers you would have, and so the overhead. Uh, usually a good rule of thumb, I think, would be like five to 10% overhead if you go beyond 32 GB. Um, I would also actually keep it under, assuming we're on Linux, I would keep it under 30 GB, because after that, even though you're under 32, uh, the com pointers are compressed, but they're not aligned to uh, the virtual address zero, so the CPU will have you know, to do more cycles to, um, to access those addresses. Um, so yeah, like 30 GB would be, I think, a hop. Um, beyond that, uh, I would think about garbage collection. Garbage collection, if the garbage collector is fast enough to, uh, to give me the throughput I need and also the latency. Um, but this 32 GB problem, let's call it, uh, will create basically a hump. So you either have it under 30 GB, is what I would say, or over, let's say, 45. Because otherwise, if you have like 35, it's probably, you might as well have 30. Um, I think, you know, you can even go over 100 gigs uh, with, a single, with a single node, but I think that's a bit of a stretch. But beyond those 45 GB, I think I, I would obviously measure and see if garbage collection is a problem. Um, my experience is that uh, sometimes it happens that the default settings, which are good enough for most use cases under 30 GB, the, uh, the default settings tend, I mean, sometimes uh, I see that it just doesn't have the necessary throughput, so uh, you sometimes may get out of memory errors, uh, but more often uh, there are latency issues. Uh, so there's too much pressure on the garbage collector, so uh, collecting that garbage takes too long, and you have pauses, and then it disconnects from Zookeeper and all that stuff. Um, and usually this stems from premature uh, moving of objects from the new generation to the old generation. So w if that's the case, then the solution is to increase uh, a bit the, the younger, the Eden and Survivor. Um, and also you can make the old uh, GC, the CMS, to kick in earlier to have a bit more headroom uh, by lowering uh, the initiancy occup occupancy fraction. Um, one thing that is scary for some people is to use G1 with those large heaps uh, because some recommend not to use G1 with Lucene and Lucene-based uh, search engines. Um, I personally had really good ex uh, experiences with G1 um, it has some overhead in terms of heap because um, the way it works basically for the old generation, because for the new generation it's the same, um, is that it has some regions that it tries to divide in, I think, 2048 regions or something like that. And you can also configure the, configure the region size and um, it moves uh, objects around from one region to another and, 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 um, and removes regions. So that also means it compacts heap, which CMS doesn't do. Um, and also the thing uh, I mentioned about you know, making uh, the young generation bigger if needed, this is something that G1 does automatically. So you give it a target pause time and 
then it sees how much it, garbage collection actually takes, and if it takes longer, then it tries to adapt those sizes to meet those, uh, those goals. So of course, if you uh, have a large heap, you don't wanna have a very small pause time because that would make it pretty much go crazy. Uh, you need to be reasonable, so to speak. Um, if you wanna uh, read more about garbage collection, I think that's a really good page to start on, the, uh, the wiki that was written by Sean, and then it has a lot of references to a lot of concepts that I think are very interesting. Let's go back into more, let's say, Docker territory, uh, as normally you would have more than one, one node per host. Uh, one thing uh, to look for is the number of threads, uh, because uh, up, up, I mean, before Java 9, um, most defaults are, have to do with the number of uh, cores that, are, that the host has and not the number of cores that you set for the container as a limit. Um, and so those threads are, uh, can be garbage collection related um, or can be facet threads. Those, you know, you would configure manually anyway, but also uh, merge threads because those are usually uh, automatically uh, set according to the number, to the total number of cores. Uh, though with merges, and uh, uh, my colleague Rafael did, did a talk on those uh, with optimize and all that, um, if you're running, those also depend on I.O. So if you're running on SSDs, you probably want to have one merge thread per node. Um, but if you're running on really fast SSDs, then the problem is shifted back to CPU. So you're, uh, again, back to deciding how many threads you want per container and not, uh, not regarding the, the overall uh, CPU. With Java 9, it's gonna be uh, smarter. It's gonna uh, figure out that it's running in a container and it has that many CPUs. Now, speaking of container limits, um, with memory, uh, I mentioned that operating system caches are uh, managed separately. So um, you normally, let's say if you have a heap of 30 gigs, you normally allocate something like uh, 40 to give, give it some headroom for the, for the other stuff. Uh, but you don't need to include the operating system caches in that container limit because this isn't accounted for. Um, and that would be confusing because it, it, it can go then much further. Um, one thing about CPU, because normally you would give it a, a percentage or something like a C, how many CPU shares to give to a certain container. So let's say 20% of the host CPU. Um, the problem with that is if you're running on a host that has multiple NUMA nodes. Uh, so those are typically uh, on a multiprocessor, um, you know, physical machine. Uh, the point is for a specific processor, you have a, an, a region of memory that's accessed faster than the other regions which belong to other processors. And Docker isn't aware of that. So you can end up with the solar node that has some threads running on one processor, some threads on another processor, and then they uh, access across uh, the nodes and that's gonna be slower. Um, so one way is to just rely on the kernel, which should theoretically uh, balance those threads so that uh, threads of, a, uh, of the same processor, uh, of the same process, end up on the same NUMA node. Uh, but you can also set, uh, use CPU set to pin a specific uh, container to, uh, to, let's say, core zero, core one, core two, something like that. Uh, the same applies to operating system caches. Um, by default, uh, if, uh, if operating system caches fill up the memory of one node, then you will prefer allocating caches to another node, even if it has to go across nodes, uh, than to hit the disk, which may or not be the best thing. I haven't tested it. Uh, I guess it will also depend on the use case, but you can configure that with the system option, zone reclaim mode, which, which can make it reclaim uh, uh, least recently used uh, uh, caches from the current node in order to allocate them the new ones there. Um, one really interesting uh, bug that I've encountered is, um, which goes back to Java 7 update 80. That was actually the last version where, where it worked. Uh, and it was fixed uh, in May this year or something like that, really recently. Uh, 
Uh, so unless you have a very, very recent Java version, you're very likely to be, to be, uh, to be hit by this bug. Uh, basically, on all busy MMAP systems, which Solar is typically, uh, if you map and unmap because you know, segments are merged and things like that, uh, then those operating system caches aren't actually given back to the operating system, and instead, they are mapped as if they belong to the process. So what you see is the RSS is growing. So like if you do a free, you will see the used memory growing and the cached memory shrinking until eventually the host runs out of memory and then the OM killer kicks in. And actually the thing about the OM killer, it doesn't necessarily kill the app that uh, requests memory because it has no clue you know, which app has a, has a memory leak. It will give scores depending on mostly how much memory is being used. Uh, and so that's why typically solar gets killed even if sometimes it may not be solar's fault. Um, if you encounter situations like this, uh, one uh, option that I find uh, interesting for debugging is uh, native memory tracking. You can see like over time, it's gonna add some overhead of course, but you'll have a detailed log of how much memory is, is going to be allocated. Um, and there are also some other uh, things that I find that are good practices. Of course, one of them is not to overbook memory. So if you have like 128 gigs, you don't want to have five nodes with 30 gigs each because you can, because the operating system will gladly tell Solar, sure, here's 30 gigs of heap, but it doesn't actually allocate it until it's needed. So you can start those five containers and figure out down the road that some of them started to be killed by the OM killer. Um, so you probably want in that situation to have, let's say, two nodes of 30 gigs each, and that will give you know, 60 gigs for OS caches, and that should be fine. Um, and if you do that, then you will also probably want to use always pre-touch, which will zero out the, the memory that gets allocated, and that actually allocates that memory, doesn't only get a promise, uh, and that also ensures that that memory isn't fragmented. Uh, Another system option is minimum three kilobytes. This is kernel's, let's say, reserve, which defaults to 64 uh, megabytes. So if you have a host with like two terabytes, it's very likely that that's too small. So some other stuff that I find interesting in, the, in this area um, is that not only the JVM has bugs um, in, in this sort of setup, but of course Docker is also young technology, it's also full of in interesting stuff. Um, but also the kernel, which you would say, okay, it's a mature piece of software. Well, it is, but not necessarily in this setup with the whole you know, huge machines or with C groups. This is you know, a feature that's been for a while, but not so, so much used that, uh, as it is uh, now. Um, you need to make sure that uh, each process have, is able to have enough open files and to lock enough memory, of course. Um, if there are issues, if you have bugs, the place that I look pretty much the first um, is uh, the message. So you'll see, you know, if there's an OM killer or something like that, you see very detailed stuff about what happens, uh, including like how, you know, if, if an OM killer is triggered, you will see what process, um, allocated how much memory, because you see order zero, order one, that's how the power of like how many pages it, uh, it requested. Uh, so if it's order zero, it's one page of four kilobytes. Um, another thing that I find interesting is if you look at top and you see the uh, KSwap D process going to like 100%, um, that process is, let's say, uh, um, the, uh, the kernel's uh, garbage collector, which run, runs on a single thread, wakes up when there's not enough memory, it needs to reclaim something really quickly. Um, so if that's 100%, it's a sign of a problem. It's a sign that the, uh, the kernel cannot allocate and they allocate fast enough. Um, so the solution for that, mm, I don't really know. Uh, it depends on the, on the situation. Um, the obvious one is to use uh, smaller hosts or um, you know virtual machines, um, but I would also um, bring up a few things that I didn't really test yet. Uh, one would be uh, if NIOFS becomes a solution now, because with MMAP you do a lot of allocation and the allocation of data with NIOFS would probably not. So. Um, and IOFS is typically slower than MMAP, so that's why you know it's not so so much used. 
But um, if you think about allocation and deallocation, there's this transaction look-aside buffer, which is a C a CPU's uh, cache of you know, knowing where, to, uh, where each page is allocated. So if you thrash that too much, then you lose performance. So I'm not sure if it's actually faster in these sort of extreme situations. Um, it's also, I think, debatable whether absolutely no swap is a good idea, especially in the case of Docker where you can configure per container whether you want the container to be swapped or not. So for solar, yeah, sure, you don't want to swap the JVM heap, but maybe you want to swap the memory of some other process that you have running on the same host, uh, or um, maybe you want to swap, uh, let's say, uh, our syslog that's running on, on the host's operating system, right? That may not be such, such a big of a deal. Um, with MMAP, there's this interesting concept of MMAP arenas. So it, the kernel does this optimization where uh, when you request uh, to access a file and it, it needs to allocate that virtual memory, it's not, on, uh, it's not like a big blob of memory. It divides it into arenas and it tries to uh, have more, smaller manageable chunks. And there, you have more arenas the more memory you have. And so there's a trade-off here between you know, if you have more, many small arenas, it's gonna be cheaper to allocate and deallocate, but it, it may find that some arena's full and needs to try again. Um, and this is actually something that amplified the bug that I uh, talked about earlier on with MMAP, because if you have many mem uh, arenas, then it will try in different places and it will be locked in all that places, so the, the leak is, is running faster. Uh, there's another thing that's usually not recommended to be used with big data systems, you know, such as solar, uh, which is transaction, uh, sorry, transparent huge pages. Um, with, uh, so, so what huge pages are normally a page is four kilobytes, right? So if you have a lot of memory, uh, it's very difficult to keep track of all the addresses. Um, so huge pages, which is disabled by default, uh, makes pages of, let's say, two megabytes. Um, and so that will make this transaction look-aside buffer may be more efficient in terms of looking at, at pages. The downside is if you want to access, let's say, a segment that's 10 kilobytes, you're going to have to read two megabytes instead in, and cherry-pick those, those 10 kilobytes. So again, I think it's a trade-off here that, uh, that may be worth looking at. Um, if you want to learn more about Linux memory management, there's that site, linuxmm. Org. I find it's kind of old school in, in terms of how it looks and how it's written, but there's a lot of uh, information there, and I'm quite amazed about how, how little things I know about memory allocation. Um, so that's pretty much all I have. Uh, I'm just going to do a quick recap. I think I like orchestration. Uh, I, I'm very excited about Kubernetes. Um, and... Uh, I like the fact that operating system caches are shared between containers. I think that's also a thing that we can take advantage of. Um, and it might actually get a lot of traction sort of internally, especially in our company when it comes to, you know, getting people involved and having really that thing with uh, the same environment from development to production. The um, thing is, when you automate, you obviously need to get things right. You're not having those two nodes that you can just SSH into and, and fix things on the fly. Um, so, yeah, th then that's a, uh, a challenge, I think. Uh, and also a challenge is, I guess, the ecosystem, uh, which is still young, still has those, those bugs, those things that, uh, that will need to be ironed out. But I think it's, you know, overall is a doable thing, I would assume. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, if you have time during the break, please visit our booth. Um, we're also hiring. And you know, feel free to reach out via I don't know Twitter, email, everything. Um.